Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today uh, for our webinar on purpose-led uh, strategy. My name is Dee Corrigan and I am Head of Corporate Engagement here at Blueprint. Um, I'm delighted today to be joined by Rebecca, Rebecca Marmot uh, from Unilever, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer there. Uh, we've got Dominic Emery, Chief of Staff at BP, and Ollie Holborn, uh, Director of Strategy at NatWest. Um, I have an incredible amount of ground to cover today uh, with the panelists, uh, but before I do, I just want to give a brief um, overview of housekeeping. Um, the webinar has been recorded and that will be shared with you and others after the event. Uh, we are planning to open up for discussion for audience questions at around 5.50ish. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, could you please submit this via the Q&A facility? which is visible on your Zoom app. So that's the Q&A rather than the message function. Um, unfortunately, I'm sure we'll get quite a few questions in and we probably won't be able to get to everyone. But um, if I do call on you to ask your question, um, Amelia or Sula, who are both behind the scenes here today helping me, will unmute you um, and you'll be able to ask your question live. So let's uh, get cracking with um, with today's session. Um, so thank you, Dominic, Ollie, and Rebecca. Um, so before we dive into what is purpose, what's purpose-led strategy, I'd love to, by way of an introduction, just to hear from each of you on why you do the work that you do and what change you're hoping to see in the world as a result of that work. Uh, so Ollie, can I call on you first, please? Sure, thanks a lot, Dee. Um, so why do I do what I do? Um, I think the role that banks play in terms of um, financial intermediation is, is, is a crucial one in society. Um, I think our role is broader than that. Uh, I think we can help educate society, for society to become more financially literate. Um, we have a huge role to play, I think, in um, our lending and what companies we lend to. Uh, and in particular, you know, shifting perhaps our lending over time to more sustainable and, and, and purpose-led companies. Um, and, you know, what do I hope to see by, by way of change? Um, ideally, what I'd love to see in 10 years time, D, is for us to be able to say, uh, this is the amount of financial capital that we have created. Um, and in so doing, we are confident that we have also added to the other forms of capital, uh, most pertinently, I think, uh, human capital um, and, and natural capital. Uh, and I think by doing that, you know, we can prove um, that we are a truly sustainable business uh, and then it can help us lend to companies that think likewise and therefore you will get a multiplier effect on the benefits to society as a whole. Great, thank you. So I guess reflecting the systemic role that banks can play if they choose to in society. Uh, Dominic, can I call on you next? Why do you do what you do? Yeah, th thanks. It's a, what a, a fantastic starter question. A real privilege to be here this evening. Thank you very much for inviting me. I think from my perspective, the opportunity to be involved at this extraordinary time in the energy transition, uh, um, working for a company that is kind of sincerely committed to net zero uh, and seeking to kind of to drive down our emissions, but also a kind of the broader purpose of the company around reimagining energy in its kind of broadest sense for people, for planet. It's a privilege and, 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 and a wonderful opportunity. Um, there are many challenges, unsurprisingly, um, in trying to take a kind of a hulking oil and gas company to something that is more, is low carbon, is kind of renewable folk, electrification focused. But, um, it's, uh, but it is galvanizing uh, the opportunity to be involved in something as, uh, as, as dramatic as this. Uh, so that's kind of, kind of why I get up in the morning, why I come to work, why I like doing what I'm doing. Fantastic, thank you very much, Dominic. And um, we'll be hearing more about that shortly. Uh, Rebecca, why, why do you do the work that you do? Well, hi Dee, hi everyone. Thanks so much for, for inviting me this afternoon. Um, I think for me, I, there's a massive opportunity at the moment to shift the business world to this more inclusive version of, of, of capitalism. So actually really make a contribution to the sustainable development goals, to the one and a half degree cap, thinking about how you can operate your business in a different way for the good of lots of different stakeholders. So not just financial return is massively important, but also all the people we touch across our value chain, so farmers, uh, underrepresented uh, minority groups, really thinking, 
then how do we use the power and reach of our business to then influence people to live more sustainably? And, and, and I do my job because I'd like to think that I can make a tiny contribution towards helping my business Unilever, our business Unilever, and, and the rest of the business world to, to, to make those kind of shifts. So it really motivates me to think that I can try and, and play a tiny little part of that. Great, thank you. And of course, Unilever being such an incredible global company with huge supply chains, it's not an insignificant impact either. Um, so great. I, I think before we get into the kind of the how you develop a purpose ed strategy and all of that, I've got two questions ready to frame frame our conversation today because it can be different interpretations of what it means to be purpose led. Um, so first of all is um, becoming purpose-led in our view is always a choice and you have to be very clear on the choice that you're making before going down that path. Um, and I'm conscious too, I guess, in, in thinking about this, um, that both uh, for NatWest and for BP, there was a choice made alongside a change in leadership in your organization. So with Alison Rose taking over in 2020 at NatWest and you've got Bernard Looney at BP. Um, so I'm, I'd love to hear from you, Dominic, uh, and then maybe Ali, um, you know, in making that choice, what were the questions that the executive team asked of themselves, the executive team and maybe the board too, asked of themselves in becoming purpose-led and making that choice? Yeah, thank you. It was a, it was, a, it was clear we wanted to go ahead and do this and become purpose-led, but what we also recognised that um, purpose-led just as just as a if you like an empty slogan was simply not going to kind of cut it and what we wanted to ensure um, prior to sharing our our new purpose uh, was to ladder that up with our aims our ambition our strategy and ultimately our investor proposition um, and so having all of those things coherent integrated uh, was important so it would be easy maybe to go out with a kind of a new sense of purpose, what BP is all about and kind of leave it there, but that simply wasn't going to be enough. So we spent quite a bit of time before Bernard um, was appointed as CEO in early February last year in going through all of the different building blocks that I've just described so that we were quite clear that they were coherent, that they kind of laddered up to purpose and that purpose would be the kind of the, if you like, the North Star, the guiding light for the other components of what we were seeking to change across the company. Um, and that actually took a lot of time. We, we certainly, in February last year, we didn't have our kind of strategy perfect and we had to go back to the market uh, and we intended to, in August and September last year, to, to go into more strategic depth. But we did have a sufficiently strong underpinning of what we wanted to do in terms of the transition to allow it then to be consistent with the purpose that we, we then came out with. So at the bottom line, it was... Um, ensuring that this had coherence through the organization it wasn't just a slogan and actually it was something that could really galvanize uh, galvanize our teams we did quite a lot of work internally internal kind of market research with our people and also externally to determine how the purpose we wanted to describe about ourselves would uh, would land but for us the important thing was that it was coherent and it all kind of fits together Great, thank you, which is quite important for, uh, you know, an organization full of engineers, right, that there's some clear coherence and connection between everything that you're doing. Um, Ollie, how, how would you articulate or characterize a choice that NatWest made and, and what questions did the executive team ask of themselves before making that decision? Yeah, I think, um, well, for us, dear, it was sort of an, an 18 month journey, um, exploring not only what we wanted our purpose to be, because we felt that it was the right time to refresh that for the future. Um, but we really asked some quite deep questions about what it was to be purpose-led. And, and I guess um, the executive committee kind of aligned on, on two things. Uh, one, that it's an ability um, to be empowered to make decisions based on a stakeholder view of, of life. So taking into account a broad range of stakeholder perspectives. Uh, and then the second one was really trying to move away from uh, becoming a, a kind of product-led sales engine, moving away from transactional way of banking um, to a more relationship way of banking, in, in some ways, um, like, the, like, like, like the days of old. Um, I, I think that the executive had a, had a range of questions. I think given our history, um, particularly the recent history, one of them was we, we have to be really serious about this and really coordinated uh, and really believe it from an executive committee. 
uh, perspective. Otherwise, we're not going to land this with our with our people and a, and a broader range of stakeholders. Um, and you know, there were some. I think there were some you know, some honest and upfront conversations through that eighteen month period. Um, and, and as ever, you get inflection points where you you sort of finally feel as though the, the penny is dropping. Uh, and one of those was when Margaret Heffernan actually came to speak to our executive team and on our board. Um, uh, and she focused on kind of willful blindness and the importance of being purpose led in, in the future. Um, but I think when we when we stood up in February 2020, it was important that we said to our organization, we as an executive team and as a board have made a choice. Um, but this is an ask and it's not a tell. And we're now going on a journey of exploration for, for what it means for each of you in the organization and your businesses. Um, because, you know, I think you have been a great foil in terms of telling us that we need a, a practical, um, authentic and in, in inspiring purpose. But, but given that we do a range of, we have a range of businesses and a range of customers, uh, it's important, you know, to let that journey continue. And we positioned it as a, as a sort of a 10 year journey. So we're now sort of two, two years into that journey. Great. Thank you. And we'll be exploring a little bit more about that journey shortly, too, and what you're learning from that. Um, Rebecca, I'd love to hear from you. I guess um, Unilever have been on this journey for a good 10 years, over 10 years now. Um, and for you, what do you think is the difference between a, a strategy and a purpose led strategy? So. I think when you're really thinking about putting purpose at the heart of your strategy, you've got to think through the lens of what we call at Unilever a multi-stakeholder model. So I talked at the very beginning about the different constituent stakeholders that I think about in my job. I'm thinking about investors. I'm also thinking about people and the planet. I'm thinking about our employees. I'm thinking about NGOs, different groups that all have a real vested interest in what Unilever is doing and how we're acting. So definitely you've got to look through that multiple, that multi-stakeholder model. And I think when you do that, a purpose-led strategy is about making longer term changes. It's not just about quick short-term gain. And I think that's critically important. I think the second area is really making sure that you integrate purpose at all the different points of, of, of decision making. So if I think about Unilever were a consumer goods company. That means thinking about our own operations. It means thinking about purpose across the, the, the length and breadth of our value chain. It means thinking about our brand and around what we can do in wider society. So for example, if we're one of our brands is launching a new campaign that might be focused on gender empowerment, or it might be focused uh, on something to do with nature and regeneration, you need to make sure that actually everything about the ethos of that brand and everything about the product itself is also focused on purpose. So be really transparent about the people who've been involved in the sourcing of that product or the manufacturing of that product. You need to think about the packaging. Are you enabling somebody to be able to easily recycle that product afterwards to really make sure that it's integrated at every different point? I think linked to that, the third area, you know, think about the end-to-end -end impact. Don't just cherry pick on the easy wins. Um, and then I think lastly, and, and, and this is probably the most important, is, is got to be credible and, and impactful. So there's lots of talk, rightly so and understandably so, about greenwashing. So I think you've got to think about what kind of value can the business that I'm working in create beyond just financial return for, for, for shareholders. And you've got to actually think about something that is relative to your business where you can make a meaningful and sustainable long-term impact. And I think we've seen that so much with, with companies recently going beyond this idea of doing no harm in the way that they're operating business to actually creating a much more positive impact. And I think to me, that's the, the key aspects of a, of a purpose-led strategy as opposed to a traditional strategy, which is focused on growing your business. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, Gosh, so much to kind of pick up there, I guess, in that multi-stakeholder view, it's a recognition that business is part of society, not apart from it. it sounds simple, but actually can be a, quite a fundamental shift in the way in which capitalism has been operating for a number of years. Um, and yeah, that fully integrated view. And also just, I liked what you said about being mindful of uh, the quick wins. I think there can be a focus in the business world on quick wins. Um, and I think sometimes a reframing from I much prefer like deep wins versus shallow wins. Sometimes some quick wins might help you to create deeper wins, 
but really it's about the deeper wins and they oftentimes do take a bit longer. And then also, I think there is a lot of push around the business case for um, purpose. And while our view is that, yes, in the longer run, well-run businesses that think of its role in society can create sustainable and fair returns for investors, but it's not a frictionless win-win. And there might be some things that a business that is profitable have to stop doing in order to create the pivot that's needed. Um, so Rebecca, just in terms of, you've been at Unilever 15 years, um, which is an incredible time, I guess, and a, and a huge transition for that organization over that time. What progress have you witnessed within Unilever? Oh, you're on mute there, Rebecca. <laughs> Goodness me, you think I would have learned over the past uh, 18 months, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, I mean, not, I guess, Unilever, of course, it doesn't operate in isolation. You know, we, we're, we're part of a, of a bigger ecosystem in, in all the countries and, and communities where we're operating. I think generally uh, within the business world and, and to a certain extent in a number of, a number of, sort of big companies, 10, 15 years ago, I mean, many businesses were still stuck in that Friedman doctrine of, of, of shareholder primacy. So the most important thing was around that short-term shareholder return. And then you had some sort of philanthropy charity work on the side, um, which you know, was, was great, but, but, but felt very distinct and different from, from the core of the business. So at the time when we launched the, the USLP back in 2010, I think to a certain extent, we were a little bit of an anom anomaly and a bit of an outlier. Um, as, as time progressed, society progressed, the world started to view things in a different way. The sustainable development goals and, and the run up to them being launched in 2015, I think was a massive marker in how so many different businesses started to think about what's our role and what's our contribution and how can we still grow and be profitable and you know to be totally crystal clear, all the work that we're doing at Unilever is based on helping us to grow the business, but grow the business in a sustainable way that's more equitable for the different stakeholders we were talking about. It, it, it is very much based on that very core business belief. But I think as the SDGs came along, there was a lot of outreach to the private sector, which hadn't historically been, been part of that UN process with, with, the, with the SDGs predecessor, the Millennium Development Goals. And I think when the business world started to be involved and started to contribute to these conversations about how do we collectively solve these massive big macro level problems around climate change, around gender, around uh, economic growth, job security, employment opportunities, etc. I think it really started to help lots of businesses to think there is something more that I could do and actually I'm going to see that coming back to me in terms of improved brand equity, I'm going to hopefully in the longer term see greater growth. Perhaps there's things that I can do to minimize risk in my business. Actually, there's some cost savings that I can make if I start shifting to renewable energy. So I think that was a huge, huge opportunity. And I think with governments as well, they also realized, actually, we can't solve all of this on our own. We need to engage with the private sector. And then obviously, you know, with COVID more recently, there's been such a shift and a, and a change in so many people's business models and a big shift that we've seen to, to, to online. We've seen much greater pressure now and demand from consumers across all different sectors of society to want to actually know a lot more about the products and the services that they're buying. So you know, in the FMCG world, that might be around provenance and around transparency and in sourcing, but in services as well, wanting to understand or people paid a fair wage for the work that they're doing. So I think the clarity and, and the ex expectations today um, of what business is expected to do is, is much clearer and actually contribute to solving some of society's problems, don't profit from them. And if you do do that, then you're actually going to be able to grow more strongly. And of course, as well, we've seen a massive increase from therefore the investor community in ESG and really wanting to understand and shift into companies and into sectors that are helping to do those kind of things. And I think, you know, the last point to add as well, you know, I've, I've really seen over, particularly since COVID, but perhaps sort of over the past three or four years, just before COVID too, you know, much greater understanding and access to information that everybody now has in the world, which is driving, I think, much greater demands from consumers around, around this transparency. Great, thank you.
Rebecca. And, you know, I think you're right around the SDGs. We see still organizations sometimes do the strategy work and then do a checklist against the SDGs rather than using the SDGs as an input into the strategy process because there's phenomenal insights there around where what the big problems and mega problems are, the problems that we can profitably, um, you know, meet. Um, so, Ollie, um, I think NatWest announced, was it February 2020, um, your commitment to, to being purpose-led? Um, and you mentioned earlier this journey that you're on and, and you see it as a 10-year journey. Where, how would you characterize where NatWest are today? Um, and I'd also love to hear what you're learning from that too, two years into your journey. Thanks, Dee. Um, great question. I, I guess um, we did characterize it as a 10-year as a journey. I think we use that as a proxy for uh, the, journey, the journey never ends. It just, it just keeps continuing. Um, but in that regard, look, we are still, we're still early, I think, on our journey. Um, I think in some ways uh, the, the pandemic allowed us to to accelerate our journey and, and it provided us, I think, with a with a guiding light or, or a north star for our people. Uh, I think what we're learning, though, is that, you know, we have a task to keep up the momentum as the as the pandemic becomes endemic. And we need to make sure that some of the lessons that, that we learned from a time which was incredibly difficult for people, families and businesses across society, um, we need to. We need to continue to learn. Um, I think we're learning that we need to keep listening. Um, we did commit to, to listen more um, when we launched our purpose-led strategy. And I think we've continued to do that, but you need to continue to, to, to flex the muscle. Um, I think we've learned that if you have a, a community of, of people and volunteers who are, who are passionate about helping you embed it in the organization, then they can be a, a real force for good. Um, and we did a, a pretty big listening exercise um, midway through through the um, the, the pandemic, um, and we came up with sort of five themes um, that we wanted to try and hold on to dearly um, whenever the whenever the pandemic passed. Um, and just to mention a couple of those, one of those which was really important that came back from people was to be you know human centred, uh, and by that you know an organisation that, that values. Um, serving the holistic needs of, of people, acting with both humility and humanity. And then I think um, another one was kind of distributed leadership. So giving people uh, the freedom and support to have a voice in their work, taking decisions, you know, close to the customer. Um, so, so, you know, we're trying to preserve some of those kind of healthier ways of, of doing things. Um, the, the other thing that we've learned actually is... Um, uh, one of our subsidiaries, Coots, was, was very keen to become a B corporation. Um, and we explored becoming um, the whole NatWest group becoming a, um, a B corporation. And we thought we would, we would start with Coots. And I think Coots have found that really helpful um, to get colleagues aligned around being sustainable by being purposeful. So I think, so I think that's, a, that's another learning. So yeah, lots of learnings and, and we continue to learn. And I think Look, one of the positive things about this um, this seminar and this forum is, you know, I think sharing those learnings amongst each other. Right, there's no monopoly on good ideas, um, and so learning from each other, I think, is 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 hugely important as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, and and just on that piece of work that you did um, halfway through the pandemic to understand there was I had some listening done around then to understand what were the new patterns of, and ways of working emerging um, that aligned around your purpose. And, you know, I just, um, it, I think there was a kind of an unleashing, wasn't there, of potential around that time because people could start to connect. I think, was it, was there about 40,000 calls to elderly and vulnerable people during that yeah. time? Like, so you ended up doing things that maybe, during business as usual or without the announcement to become purpose-led, you know, enabled, I guess, a different kind of activity to happen. Um, so just thought the work that you did around the, the, what were the newer kind of patterns emerging? How can you hold on to those new patterns emerging? was really interesting. And actually, in, when Charles and I looked at it, there was such an alignment around the behavior section in our framework. And that's because these behaviors have, are all orientated around the common good and dignity and value of people. So I just thought that was really interesting that this is what was coming to the surface within the organization. So uh, thank you for letting us have a look at that. And, you know, certainly that's a learning that we've been sharing with other organizations too. Uh, Dominic, um, 
I guess when I think of BP and it was a relatively recent announcement um, around your purpose, reimagine, reimagining energy for people and planet. Um, I guess in particular, given the sector that you're in um, and the pressure now and the, and the very narrow window for change that you have, there's a real tension between purpose and performance. Um, and I just wondered, you know, uh, you know, a focus on pace is necessary so that purpose and performance stay in step. But how do you balance the energy and push for change with the transitional realities of having a very large organization? Um, and then also, I guess the question that when I was thinking about this that came to mind was, I recognize that there's a need for pace and that there's the realities and practicalities of shifting a large organization. And at the same time, my concern is what if the rate at which BP transforms is not fast enough for what the world truly needs? Um, so yeah, just would love to hear your response to that. Yeah, they're very big questions. And I think that the pace, uh, the pace point is, is very substantial because inevitably we will be too fast for some and too slow for others. And so we have to tread this kind of tightrope of an and conversation, which is around performing and transforming at the same time. Uh, this is one of the, if you like, the fundamental kind of principles that, that we, we try to lay out when we launched our purpose and we started to talk about our aims and ambitions, the things have to work in parallel. Without nearer term performance, there is no cash generated to invest in the new. Um, without a kind of a vision and excitement about building the future, there is no future. So again, maintaining the tension between the here and now and the uh, the plans for the future is uh, it's a challenge. And it's a kind of a tightrope that we, we walk in a number of different dimensions. One is the people dimension. One is the asset class dimension. So transferring from oil and gas assets to renewable assets, to vehicle electrification, to biorefineries, et cetera. And then there's the other transformation, which is around our stakeholders and particularly our investors. And so we, we need to take our investors with us, those who are on the register already. We also need to bring new investors into the into the stock to support the transition. And at the moment, in a sense, there's a sort of bifurcation of investor interests on the one hand in the near term kind of yield of the company, which with current oil prices is quite attractive. Um, but also we want to invite investors in because of the growth opportunities in the renewables and electrification sector into which we're investing increasing amounts of, uh, of capital. Um, and also to be relevant for ESG investors, because as we've seen, there's been an absolute explosion in e ESG investments in the last few years from $1 in every 10 to $1 in every two just about at the moment. So trying to appeal to those different investor classes and take investors on that journey with you. And the other two critical constituencies are our broader stakeholders, particularly our NGO community. And one of the things that we did at the very start, uh, in fact, um, uh, when, when Bernard was first announced as CEO, was to, to do a kind of a, a listening and learning journey around our critics, um, particularly civil society critics, uh, also trying to create a closer relationship with the UN uh, to understand, um, and the IPCC, to really get very clear about those kind of transitional pathways and to be guided by the science. So that's something that we felt quite, quite strongly about. So with uh, net zero by 2050 being the, if you like, the guiding principle, uh, then everything else in terms of our kind of strategy development in terms of the pace of change was really then pegged to that as the uh, as the destination. But 2050 is a long way out. So putting in place some transparent targets for 2025 and some aims for 2023, both financial, operational and kind of strategic and importantly emissions aims uh, commensurate with net zero by 2050. I think that was very important to give confidence to let's call them the, our new investor class, our ESG investor class, that we were serious, uh, committed to the transition uh, and that we would measure and be, be very transparent about it, but also to give confidence to our existing investors that we weren't about to switch over night from oil and gas production to offshore wind and recognizing that this is a kind of transitional journey and we need to take this enormous kind of group of stakeholders with us. And then finally, including our own people, um, both kind of Ollie and Rebecca have mentioned uh, the, the galvanizing effect of the transition on their own on, on, on staff within their respective companies. And that's something we have to do as well. 
And we still need to do a far better job of it, creating a future for people who have traditionally worked in oil and gas into offshore wind, into carbon capture and storage, into vehicle electrification. How do we do that in a sort of compelling way? So I think that's a huge piece of unfinished business for us at the moment. Uh, these are, of course, journeys. Uh, they are never ending journeys. But the journey to net zero has to kind of finish by 2050. Otherwise, it's very challenging for the world. Okay, thank you. And uh, when I was looking at your website earlier today, just to refresh myself on, on some of the work on strategy and, and the various aims, well, quite a lot of aims that you've set there, there was a statement that said, um, our beliefs about the future of energy. And I was just wondering, what, what, what are BP's beliefs about the future of energy? Um, I think fundamentally that energy needs to be decarbonized. Um, energy systems need to tr have a trajectory towards net zero by 2050. I think that is the, in a sense, the kind of the, the, the fundamental kind of bounding conditions. And in so doing, um, we anticipate that um, fossil energy will become increasingly kind of risky to be an investment proposition. Low carbon energy will become, well, has fantastic, almost infinite growth associated with it. So our, our beliefs about energy is that the world wants cleaner, more affordable energy, um, sustainable energy, and as quickly as possible. And what we kind of seek to do is to, um, to chart our transition and to roadmap our tra transition towards those three, towards those three principles. Um, again, in some areas, we'll be able to kind of dial up and do things more quickly. In other areas, it will be kind of slower. It will be somewhat geographically defined. Um, but nevertheless, that's the, uh, they're, the, they're the fundamental kind of beliefs that we have about the energy system. And the, the other optimistic belief I think I should add is that we do think this is possible. Um, the investment required to get to net zero to replumb and rewire the world's energy system is something of the order of $100 trillion. Um, Mark Carney said that, the International Energy Agency have said it. So it sounds like a lot when you say it like that, but actually it represents maybe 2% of global GDP over the next kind of 30 years. And this seems to be a very modest price to play, uh, pay to achieve a transition of that magnitude, to de deliver clean air and to, to, to reduce and eliminate CO2 emissions. Great, thank you. Um, so in terms of you know, getting into the actual process of how you develop and implement a strategy, um, Rebecca, I'd love to hear from you in terms of what is different about how you approach strategy development today, you know, that there's kind of tighter integration now in terms of your purpose and your sustainability goals and objectives into the core business. What is different today about how you actually develop that strategy? What's different about the process? So we, we launched a new strategy uh, at the beginning of last year called the Unilever Compass. Um, um, what we did was really ensure that we could put sustainability front and center of, of, of the work we're doing. So the, there's five big strategic choices and that none of them will probably surprise you. There's one on portfolio, there's one on our brands, there's one on, on markets, there's one on channels and there's one on culture. So nothing out of the ordinary that you wouldn't expect. But then what we've done is, is look through the lens of that multi-stakeholder model that I keep talking about um, and put sustainability across all of those different areas, you know, and then you start to see how it's actually a little bit different. So, you know, some of the portfolio choices, for example, around plant-based foods, we've done that because we know that it's a huge growth area, but it's also good for your health and it's good for the planet. Massive bet for us on, on hygiene. It's an area where we've got a lot of, of experience uh, historically in water, sanitation and hygiene. And we're the world's largest soap producer. We have big brands like Domestos where we really tie in the social impact that we can have with our product um, into the core benefits of the product as well. So you, when you look through the strategy, you see where we've put sustainability really front and center. And if I sort of think about how we even got to those choices in, in the first place, as our USLP was coming to an end in, in 2020, we spoke to 40,000 different employees around the business, asking them about their views on the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which was our core sustainability plan, the original one. And then how did they feel and what did they feel that Unilever ought to be focusing on as we looked ahead for the next 10 years? And so we said, what are those big macro level issues that you worry about? And then secondly, what do you think Unilever is best place to, to, to solve? So I think you know, it's a much more inclusive process than there ever has been historically where you've just got a small group of senior leaders deciding what's going to be right for the business. And then we also asked a number of those external stakeholders, 
the same questions to get really a full range of, of, of views and opinions. So definitely that first part, I'd say, is around inclusivity. I think the second part is really looking at what are the bits that we can change ourselves and what are the bits that actually we need to advocate on and work with others. So you know, we would call that at Unilever a systems change approach. So actually, when you look across the strategy and you look across those targets and goals that you've set yourselves in either core commercial targets or perhaps where we really integrated sustainability in the business into one, part of our strategy has been to say, well, who else is it that we need to work with beyond our own operations and influence if we want to achieve those goals and targets? It might be supplier relationships. It might be through some of our, what we would call our customers or our big supermarket chains, for example. Who do we need to work with at a government level or at an industry body level? It could be the Consumer Goods Forum. It could be groups like WBCSD, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and really work out where is it that we want to focus on changing the system. So actually, perhaps it's lobbying for the renewable energy infrastructure and, and some really interesting work there um, that BP were just talking about, rather than just thinking about what we can do within our own world. So I think lots of different, very practical changes now in the way that, that companies are approaching strategy development. So much more holistic, much more, much more inclusive, really seeking external perspectives from a wider variety of, of stakeholders, ultimately, because if we do that and we understand how to better serve those varying different stakeholders, we'll be able to grow the business in a more sustainable way. And then that last point around thinking about that ecosystem within which you're operating and recognizing where and with whom you need to work in order to be able to advance because you're not going to be able to get it all done just as, as, as your own company. Great, thank you. I love the emphasis there both on inclusivity, but also taking a systems approach, which makes me think in particular, if I think of the days gone by of the way, as you said, strategy got kind of developed in behind closed door by a, a, a small few. Um, that this is very different and that requires different types of capability and skills and leadership. What, what are you seeing in terms of actually the change in terms of those skills, those capabilities, how people are leading? Put myself back on mute, sorry. <laughs> um, well, I think it's, I mean, I think we've talked a little bit about the, the, the shift in attitude and, and the shift in terms of approach. So. I think there's a, a massive part of this is trying to develop a much more inclusive approach to how people are approaching business, how we're approaching leadership skills and capability and, and skills development. I think you know we've seen a, a big shift into much more humility from, from business leaders. I think much more you know, questioning, got to be much more ingenuous now, really think about problem solving and, and, and new solutions. I think getting out of that silo mentality and being much more open to, to engagement, you know, and, and being much more adaptable as well. I know the world is changing so much around us. And I think being aware of what your target audience is thinking, you know, your key constituents around your business is hugely important. And being able to flex and be adaptable to that, I think is, is hugely, hugely important. So when you think back to some of the, the, the examples that I was giving about you know, how we've recently approached the new strategy process at, at Unilever, you, know, you see that leaders are going to be acting in, in, in a different way. There's going to be other stakeholders who are much more relevant in the process. We, we've also got, for example, a couple of different external sustainability councils. One, which is a, a group of senior external leaders who are real specialists in their areas. But then the other, which is, which is something we just started this year called our Next Gen Sustainability Council. So a group of young people, 18 to 25, who have a completely different uh, and very interesting perspective and approach to both what we hear from our, our Sustainability Advisory Council and, and sometimes leaders within the business too. And I think getting that diversity of perspective and opinion is, is so refreshing. Uh, and ultimately, I think it makes for a much more robust strategy in business. Love that. Yeah, I think it's incredibly energizing when we start to think more broadly and engaging more broadly. Um, Ollie, um, I mean, you look to develop the strategy, at least the, the three pillars uh, aligned to your purpose prior to announcement so that there was a strong kind of direction of travel. Um, and you continue to execute on that strategy today. Um, just with an emphasis on trying to share learnings here today, what traps do you think people should be aware of in developing and executing a purpose-led strategy? And can you provide a couple of examples? 
Sure. Um, great question, B. So I think there were probably sort of what I would call four, four purpose pitfalls, um, which I'll talk through briefly and then I'll try and give you one, one or two examples. I think purpose pitfall number one is you, you can't be purposeful um, and, and profitable. Um, I think that's pitfall number one is, is to think about them as two separate things. I think pitfall number two is purpose is, is philanthropy, um, you know, the nice things or, or the cherry on the top of the cake. Uh, I think pitfall number three is thinking about purpose as a, a separate project or a, or a work stream. Um, and then number four, which I think is possibly the trickiest, is, is purpose always leads to a always leads to a positive outcome. I.e., you cannot make um, purposeful decisions, which are which are which are tough decisions. And so I think, you know, anyone who wants to go on this journey should just be should be wary of those. Um, and you can't avoid all of them all the time. You just have to be, I think, conscious of them and, and understand when they are when they are kind of bubbling up across the organization. I think from a NatWest perspective, um, our, our people, I think, have, have leaded quite a lot of um, discussion around how you can make difficult decisions and still be purposeful. Um, and, you know, what we've tried to say is, you know, it's about listening to a range of stakeholders before you make that decision and then balancing the needs of those stakeholders as, as best you can in the circumstances that you find yourself. Um, and that doesn't you know, always mean that it's a, an easy decision. Um, but one of the most difficult um, decisions that, that we made earlier this year was that we would leave, we would leave Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, um, which is a, you know, a market we've been in for over a over hundred years. Um, and, but, but when we looked at what our, what our purpose was and what the stakeholder needs were, um, we did a thorough analysis of the business on, on that basis. Uh, we didn't think that we could, you know, live up to our purpose, and in so doing, um, generate sustainable returns. Uh, and so, you know, we made the very difficult decision to leave. But then, having made that decision, we then said, well, how do we leave in a way that um, best meets the needs of of the stakeholders? And so, we looked through that stakeholder lens again, and we said, well, how does leaving affect? How's it going to affect our people, our customers, our suppliers? Um, and what can we do to make that um, withdrawal kind of orderly and, and, and phased? What can we do to, to retrain you know, those people? Um, what can we do to make sure that you know, any sales of assets and liabilities that we do do enables us to, to keep people if we can or give them an opportunity somewhere else? You know, how do we make it easy for our customers to, to transfer their accounts? So we went, we went through all of that and it wasn't just a financial calculation. It was much um, it was it was much broader than that, which I think was encouraging. And and actually, you know, the board were very challenging to us as well in terms of making sure that we considered all of these aspects. And it's a this is a multi year um, a multi year decision that we were taking, and it was a it was a very difficult one. But that's probably that's probably the best um, you know the best example that I can give you. Okay, thanks, Ali. Um, so we've we've talked a number of times around stakeholders and the change from like I guess what has been in the past either a done to or a kind of a transactional nature to to um, stakeholders and um, and actually involving them in the development of your strategy and hearing from them because they have just as interesting insights as you know the traditional ways and places you would have went for insights. Um, as an organization. Um, so in the middle of our five principles, we have um, enables and welcomes public scrutiny of alignment between stated purpose and actual performance. Um, and I guess implicit in that is an acceptance that public scrutiny is not only welcomed, but actually valued and seen as a critical input into the transformation of a company, as kind of Rebecca mentioned earlier. But I think we've seen some companies, and I guess in particular in the in, in big oil in the past, in the big oil majors, uh, using delay and distract tactics to um, avoid engaging critics and the public more broadly on topics of concern. Um, so Dominic, not expecting you to talk for the whole oil and gas industry, but from blue from um, BP's perspective, is that changing? And and what are you doing differently? So it is absolutely changing, and I totally get your point about kind of delay and distract tactics. Um, there's a um, there's a fantastic kind of book that was published uh, um, several years ago about um, about some of the delay and distract tactics around tobacco, around acid rain, around the ozone layer, 
and of course around climate change. Um, and it, it, it actually put the causes back for all of those by at least a decade and maybe more. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, in, some ex in some instances, the, um, the oil and gas in industry was, uh, was complicit in that. And that is not a, a legacy to be proud of. Um, so we want to kick on kind of dramatically from kind of those, those days. And one thing that we said as we laid out our new aims back in February last year was to be a leader in transparency. Now, just by saying you want to be a leader in transparency kind of puts you up there on a bit of a pedestal to, to lead in transparency, to be able to kind of describe your journey, but also the different targets uh, and the different uh, elements of that journey to the public. Um, and they may be financial aims, they may be emissions aims, they may be biodiversity aims, but in so doing, seeking to be a transparency leader, you need to live up to it. And so what we've chosen to do is to publish a set of 20 aims, um, of which uh, 10 are, if you like, related to carbon and emissions reductions, and then 10 are related to broader sustainability uh, aspects, biodiversity, human rights, et cetera. And then really asking our stakeholders to kind of judge us on progress. And we will publish progress against all of those aims as part of our usual reporting process and as part of special interest groups where we've had input into the development of those aims in the, in the first place. So I think transparency actually is our friend. Um, I think it helps to kind of uh, take away some of the kind of the negative taste of the kind of the um, destabilizing tactics of the kind of prior decades from, uh, from this industry. Uh, and it's really refreshing because you can be held to account. You can demonstrate hopefully progress. Uh, you can also um, hold your hand up and say, actually, we haven't done very well here. And this is how we're seeking to improve. Uh, and so willing to engage with stakeholder groups around transparency, we think is a, is a critical part of our new approach uh, to, the, uh, to, to BP and to the energy transition most broadly. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna do this super, if we can do this last part super quick so I can get to the questions, but I do like to finish in this way. Um, for each of you, what gives you cause for concern? What gives you hope? And one very short piece of advice that you give someone starting out on this journey. Uh, Rebecca, can I start with you? I think con concern is social inequity. You know, we see this terrible tragedy in the, in the UK last night with a ship that sank with people trying to, to come to the UK. Um, some, some economic migrants. I worry about social inequity because I think it's been exacerbated by COVID and that really, really worries me. Um, I think what gives me hope is listening to young people uh, and actually I think they're not going to accept the status quo on social inequity or climate change and they will just ensure that as we all develop and move forward that businesses and society, everybody, you know, we're, we're all, I am part of society, we all are, that we actually choose to do things in a different way. So that gives me a lot of hope. Great, thank you. Um, one piece of advice? Oh, uh, one piece of advice on purpose, be authentic. Be authentic, great, thank you. Ollie, can I ask you super quick? <laughs> sure, um, I think the concern, uh, actually similar to Rebecca's, I think is kind of the just transition, and particularly on climate. I think we learned from the pandemic that it's, it's often those who are less fortunate who are most affected. Um, what gives me cause for hope? I was listening to a podcast on outrage and optimism run by Christiana Figueres, and she said for the first time uh, since in, in, in her lifetime focused on climate, you know, business is probably ahead of government. I thought that was that was a really hopeful message. Um, and then one piece of advice. Um, I, I think um, stick with it um, because you'll 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 be able to hire better people um, and your your days at work will be more enjoyable. Great. Thank you very much, Ali. Dominic. Um, Cause for concern it goes back to kind of Rebecca's point at the beginning around the UN SDGs, those two fundamental ones, life in oceans and life on land. Uh, we, we, have to, um, we have to be deeply concerned about what we're doing to our planet. So that, that is kind of a fundamental concern and they are essentially kind of the building block SDGs of every other one. Um, but what gives me hope, I think is the uh, is youth, is activism, I think some of the things coming out of COP26, um, I would probably give it a seven out of 10, um, but some of the things around methane, around forestation, uh, around if you add up the numbers, you can get to 1.8 degrees, which is well below two, which is in a sense, article two of the Paris Agreement. So we are getting there. Um, 
I think the private sector has a lot to offer. And I think you're echoing Ollie's point of, from uh, Christiana Figueres is a, um, uh, um, a podcast, which, which are really excellent, by the way, I'd recommend listening to all of them. Um, I think there is a, uh, I, I think um, business is really driving things here. And I think business, business is responding to consumer preferences and consumer needs. So, uh, and the piece of advice is, I think it's been said before, but uh, you know, keep going, we will get through this. Thank you very much, Dominic. Uh, so I'm gonna call on uh, Tim Littlehales, if we could unmute Tim to ask a question to the panel. Hi there, fascinating sharing your objectives. I've actually got two questions. One is obviously, when you prepare for something like this, it becomes very logical. I'm curious about what's the messiest bits that you've been that you've been dealing with, and then within that, are there some clues about what if we're behind the pace? What is it that we really need to pay attention to in order to pick up the pace to have the impact that a genuinely purpose-led strategy needs to have in the world? How do we? What do we pay attention to catch up? Tim, who did, who would you like to answer that question? I, I'm really curious, Dominic. For you, and then also Ollie, from a, I think both of you in different sectors. I think obviously Unilever has got some is a bit further advanced in terms of the learning. Okay, great, Dominic. Yeah, th thanks, Tim. So the messiest bits I think have been the organisational kind of transformation, um, which which needed to go along with the strat the strategic change, the ambition, the aims, and the purpose. Um, changing a company that had been an upstream and downstream oil and gas company for 112 years into something new and different was the most challenging and continues to be messy. We're certainly not through what we call our kind of reinvent process yet. So that has been, I think, the most, uh, the most challenging part of it for us. Um, I think it's less about organizational buy-in to the purpose and the intent of the company. It's more about the complexity of kind of interfaces, people with new jobs, and also colleagues that have left the organization because we actually reduced the size of the company from 70,000 to 60,000 people. So I think they were the most, uh, that remains, and I think will continue to remain the most challenging part of this transformation internally for us. Great, thank you. Ali. Uh, great question, thank you. So what are the, what's the messiest bit? I think the messiest bit for me has probably been when we, when we launched our purpose-led strategy, we, we felt as though we needed three focus areas and we aligned on those three focus areas because we thought that they were where we as a financial institution could make most difference to um, society so climate learning and enterprise but I think what that meant was um, people felt that just focusing on that area or areas was being purposeful and therefore um, we, we really had to up the dial on the embedding and, and mindsets piece which is something that we continue to do so I think that that's probably been the messiest bit is kind of making sure that those two of you'd hand in hand it's not just the focused areas this is a big mindset mindset shift as well that is needed um in terms of clues and where you're you know, being behind the pace i i would say listen you know, listen to your people um listen to your listen to your stakeholders there's a whole bunch of people who are who are willing to share and, and give you views um that could be ngos it could be the younger generation, um, but just get a variety of, of views and, and keep challenging yourselves as well on the uncomfortable questions. Um, you know, perhaps appoint someone, whether you're in, you know, in a meeting to say, okay, I really want you to challenge me here. So I would say, listen, um, stakeholder views and, and open yourself up to uh, open yourself up to challenge. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to call on Joe Alexander now. So we know Joe; she's been on a previous panel and works for BP. Joe, am I? Hello. Hopefully, I'm unmuted. You're good. Great. It's been a great conversation. Thank you so much. And I, I think my question is more about how you kind of bring that strategy to life, um, and how. Um, decision, how decision making is guided by purpose and sustainability, but how you embed that through the organization. And, and often I'm just very aware of how much change that creates in terms of the way we make decisions. And so how do we support the people trying to make change be successful in doing that so we can really deliver the strategy? Great. 
Um, I'm going to ask Rebecca and maybe Ali, because I know you've been doing some work on decision making capability in the organisation. But Rebecca, can you? Mm. So, I, I mean, I think, um, Jay, it's something that we've been grappling with for, for a long time at Unilever. I think one of the things that we learned from the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan was it, it, there were huge amounts of successes and lots of things that went brilliantly well, but we still hadn't totally embedded the work that we wanted to do at the heart of the business and making it part of everybody's role and responsibility. So that was the first thing we tried to do with the companies when we really put together the business, core business plan and, and the sustainability plan. I think on a practical level, we've integrated it into our governance. Um, so right the way from the board down, a dedicated board um, a subcommittee that was focused on sustainability, we've built it into a uh, management level and beyond bonus structure. So how well we do based on a number of specific KPIs impacts the amount of bonus that, that managers are getting in Unilever. So you know, really built into and the, and, the, and the metrics that we're looking at are all about sustainability progress in core different parts of the business. So I think that's hugely important. I think there's a big role around training and development. We have things like the Compass Fundamentals module. So you can go online and you can learn about all of these different aspects in terms of what does net zero actually mean? What does it mean if I'm talking about living wage? We've done purpose workshops. So everybody at Unilever, it doesn't matter what function you're in, what work level you are, what part of the world you're working in, has been to a purpose workshop to try and understand actually what's my purpose, not, not about Unilever, what's my purpose in life. And then the second part of that is, you know, how does that then translate to my job? Uh, so actually, I could be a finance assistant manager, or I could be a brand marketeer, I could be working in procurement. How am I going to show up at work and make sure that I'm really integrating my personal purpose in helping me to do better at my job? So lots of different aspects. And then I say that the other really important part that we found is you've got to bring the same structure and rigor to your measurement. So if you're talking about purpose and your part of its culture, which is, I guess, the first part of the answer, but part of it as well is about progress on targets and you need to really be able to measure very clearly what it is you're setting out to do. So clear definitions, clear on measurement and clear on reporting. So they are also then able to track how well you're doing you know, and, and, and test where things are working, where they're not and where you might need to make changes. Great. Thank you very much. So there's a kind of um, I was hearing also there that balance of extrinsic motivation through the reward structures and governance, but also intrinsic through the work that you do around, um, you know, asking people and working with people to connect to what you do in your work. Um, Ali, um, I'll just um, get your thoughts on any add ons to what Rebecca said there. How are you looking at this whole decision making approach um, at NatWest? Thanks, D. So some similar themes to Rebecca, I think, in terms of um, the, the leadership. So we've put sort of 300 people through a two day um, leading with purpose um, workshop, which just gives a lot of time for reflection um, for people to think about kind of difficult issues and problems and how they might resolve them. I think a couple of things just to build on um, from Rebecca. First of all, I think sharing stories you know, is incredibly powerful. Um, we, we've, you know, twas ever thus since we were, you know, since we were on this planet. But I think um, sh sharing those broadly across the organisation and making people feel as though you know, they understand what it is to make a difficult trade off and, and how you did it. And, and the fact that, you know, there is sometimes no, no right or wrong answer. Um, and then we're going to do some kind of next year, we're going to do some sort of purpose gaming, if that's the right word, where we're going to um, simulate difficult real life business decisions um, and ask participants to to role play, you know, what would they decide using the, the blueprint framework um, mm. with the aim of kind of building internal capability and, and getting people, you know, to reflect on, 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 on the trade-offs. So just a couple of, a couple of ads there, but I think the governance point is important. So we have in our governance pack now for any big decision, we have to put a, a stakeholder map right up front in terms of how is this decision being considered against your against your um, different categories of stakeholders. So colleagues, communities, customers, suppliers, future generations. And that's, that is super helpful. Great, thank you. And actually only yesterday we were in learning from some of the work you've been doing to change your budgeting process in terms of actually how you think about your budgeting through a stakeholder lens. All right, fantastic. Well, I'm conscious that I am over time, um, but I mean, I, I didn't get through my question list and we've got a ton more questions here as well. So I'll try and capture those and maybe we might be able to follow up via 
um, a blog of some sort. But um, I want to thank everyone uh, today um, for your time. Uh, thank you very much to Dominic, um, Ali and Rebecca. Um, I know you're all incredibly busy. Um, so thank you so much for your time and all the insights and the learnings that you have shared today. Um, all the best and have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Thank you, Dean. Thanks, bye-bye.